Are you ready to do this? We're going to get into James, James chapter 3 tonight. James chapter 3. We've gone through the first two chapters. Took us a little bit to get through it, but we got through it, and we are better for it, aren't we? I mean, because who else kicks you in the teeth better than James? I mean, he's, this is, it's tough, some of the stuff he says, and he kind of hits us all, and, and uh, if, he, he, if you haven't been hit yet, just get ready. That's all I can say, because uh, James 3 is coming, okay? And it, it's going to be a, a, a good one. Uh, it deals with the, the, the stuff that's coming out of your face. Those words that you've been speaking, the tongue that you've been using, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's, uh, let's pray and get our minds right because uh, that way we won't get offended by everything that I'm about to say. So let's, let's pray and we're going to ask God to speak to us tonight and prepare our hearts to receive this message tonight. So would you pray with me? God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this time that we get to spend together in your word. And God, we just pray that you would speak to us tonight, that you would lead us by your spirit into your truth tonight. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said amen. James chapter 3 and verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers. Can we just stop right there for a minute? Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, I didn't know that going in, okay? I didn't know that part about the, the, if you're a teacher, you're going to be judged more strictly. And, and, and you got to, like, why? Why are we going to be judged more strictly? For the simple fact that you're teaching people the word of God. And, and you can't come to this in a light manner. You can't come to this in, in, in a light, easy way. I, I remember one time, I, I, I just this guy had just, I mean, he was smoking meth like a, a two days before he came to church, Okay. And he came to church, and he, he got all excited about Jesus. He said, God's called me into men's ministry. I said, has he? Or has he called you to stop doing meth first? I mean, maybe, maybe he is calling you into ministry. Maybe he's calling you into an aspect of ministry. But you, you need to get some, some understanding into it. you got to get into Scripture. you got to get some uh, study to show yourself approved. That's Scripture. You, you got to be able to, to be able to dig into this and understand this stuff. And, and, and you can't just come in and just like, I, I'm a leader. I need to lead. But so many times people are just using a gift that God has given them to get them through where God is trying to, to, to bring them into a place of instruction, trying to bring, bring them into a place where they can, they can learn something, but they don't want to go through the process. People don't like the process. The process isn't fun. The process is expensive. It's hard. It takes time. And you got to go through that process. People think, well, you know, I want to do what you're doing on stage. I had a lady come to me one time, first time she'd ever came to church. I, I can do what you do. I'm like, good. That's great. But you don't get to. Amen. Amen. It took time for me to get to where I was able to stand on this stage. I had, I had to go jump through hoops. I had to go through things. I had to learn things. I had, I had to make a lot of mistakes, a lot of failures, a lot of, a lot of problems I had to overcome to get to this place. And you're just going to pop up overnight. It doesn't work like that. It takes time because this is important to be a teacher, any kind of teacher. I would just put it into education in general, into the public school system, private schools, home schools, to, to be able to teach and instruct. If you don't know what you're talking about, then that kid ain't going to know what he's talking about. If, if you don't know what you're, if you're, you're you, you can't do it if you don't know it. So you've got to know it. You've got to get it in you. So it, it, it's going to require more that, that, that you're going to be held to a stricter judgment. And I can tell you, churches today, that, that we're, we're, in, we're in trouble because we're, we're not holding on to this. We're just letting anybody, you got a gift, get up there. and I remember I was listening to this, this, this podcast guy, you know, this guy, on, he, he's going to tell, it was, it was for pastors and for churches. And, and what he said was, if you're over the age of, of 40, you know, 40 something, he said, you need to start considering getting out of the pulpit and getting somebody younger in there. I was like, what? I mean, I just barely got to get in it, so I ain't giving it up. But they're going to have to run me off. They're going to have to beat me with a stick to get me off this podium. But you need to get some, some life into it. Get somebody young in there that's exciting and has got a gift. 
Like, is that what it's about? Is that what, what being a minister, a preacher, a teacher of the gospel, is that you got to be young and full of energy and life? Isn't the information more important than the energy and the life? But we, we've, we've gone over that in churches before. We, we, we've, we want the energy and the life, and we're forgetting completely, because that's the, your gift is evident. You can speak Greek. Oh, I could speak about anything for a long time and not know anything about it. I mean, we've got a vice president that can do that, right? <laughs> Just word salad every time she talks, and you're like, we're here in this moment because this moment has us. And in this moment, we can experience this moment together. I mean, you said nothing, and you've been talking for 20 minutes. You're so gifted and skilled. And I'm not just making fun of the vice president, although I am making fun of the vice president. But people do that. Pastors do this stuff. They just they get up there, and they're gifting, and they're exciting, and they, they say stuff. And, and you walk out like, I don't know what he said, but he sure said it good. But there's a weight that goes in this. Why is this weight there? Look at, look at Proverbs 29, 18. Can I take you to this right quick? It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. So if there's no revelation, where do you get this? Right? Of course, yeah, you can get it from the Bible. But our churches are full of lack of revelation. There's no wisdom coming from the podiums. It's just, it, it, there's this whole bunch of, of, of social feel-good stuff that's coming from podiums, coming from the pulpit in churches. And so churches are a whole a hot mess because of it. Because there is no instruction. There is no wisdom being taught. And it says that they're cast off restraint. So we got a church full of sinners who aren't trying to change. We got a church that doesn't care what the gospel says. Because they just want to do what feels good to them. And everybody's a Christian because I'm American. It doesn't work that way. But that's the state of a lot of our churches today. We're not getting the gospel message because we got preachers that are excited about whatever they're talking about. They come in, they bring, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you'll get one or two verses and then they, they jump into stories and talking about their kid or their car or some other thing. And, and they start making this. I remember one time I was listening to this preacher at, at this revival. And it was like, man, I was like, he was really excited in what he was saying. He's talking about this shipwreck and these, these lifeboats and, and the, the, the lighthouses and all this stuff. And he's telling this big old story. And I'm like, I'm still waiting for the verse to write it down. And yet he gets all the way. He, he preaches for 30 minutes and didn't give one verse not one verse now what he said wasn't bad but he had not established the authority of the word of god oh he told a great story but what's the thing that changes people is it our story or is it the word of god it doesn't say it's the washing of the water of your story that god is cleansing his bride with it says that he's cleansing his bride with the washing of the water of the word and if we're not into the word, we're missing it. So you can't be surprised when people are casting off restraint, living however they want, just doing what, oh, they show up on Sunday and they pay their tithe. That's good. Nothing else matters. That's not what it's about. It's about the proper instruction to change lives. And because of that, there's many pastors that are going to face a harsh judgment because of the deception. Oh, and I know you can say, well, that's just your accusation. Because I know people have accused me of the same thing. Your preacher's going to send that church straight to hell. Somebody told me that once. So I thought we were going the other direction, but okay, I guess. Because in Luke chapter 12 and 48... The weight is heavier for those who are teaching. It, halfway down through that, it, it starts out at, at the last sentence there. From every, because you're going to get hung up on like it, but it says something about beating with few blows. What is that talking about? It, it, well, we'd have to go to the verse before that, but I, I really, you know, if, if you don't, if you know a lot, it literally is what it's going to tell you. If you, if you know a lot and you don't do it, you're going to be beaten severely. This is that's what it says. But if you don't know and you're ignorant and you don't do it, you won't beaten as, be beaten as badly. 
okay? But it's just, you, a beating's still coming, okay, if you ain't doing it right. But the, the last part explains why. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I remember somebody asked me one time, what do you know? And I said, I don't know anything because they're going to expect something from me. Because the more you know, the more you're going to have to share, the more you're going to have to do. The more you get to know of God's word, the more it's going to be expected of you to share what you know. Well, when do I get a preacher on stage? Never. I'm not sharing. But you don't have to preach from a stage to tell people about Jesus. Maybe all you know is what Jesus has done for you. Share that with somebody. Because as soon as you give your life to Jesus, he's expecting you to, to keep one hand forward on him and the other hand reaching back to pull somebody with you. Every one of us are called to bring people into the kingdom of God by using what you know. Now, don't get stuck on what you know. Keep growing in what you know. And how you're going to do that, you keep getting into the word. Keep digging into this thing. And if you're confused, ask somebody. I mean, you can even ask the Holy Spirit because you know what he said? Remember, we read this chapter 1 of James. If you're seeking wisdom, ask. And the one who, he who gives generously will give it to you. You can find the answers. We have to know the truth. Proper revelation. Proper truth. The world is hungry for it. And they need it. Verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. Man, that is a comforting thought, isn't it? We all stumble. All stumble in many ways. Now, you may have one or two ways. My ways may be different than your ways. But we're all stumbling in something. Now, stu anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. But we all fall. We all stumble in many ways, and I, 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 that it brings comfort to me to know I, I'm not. God's not expecting me to be perfect. Okay, He's not expecting me to have all my act together, to know all of it, to, to have all of the answers, to never fail. Because I will not be perfect until I step out of this life and into the next. And that is just by His grace that He allows me to be perfect. Because that's what He needs in His presence is for me to be perfect. So He makes me perfect in that place. But here, man, I'm a hot mess still, and I'm your pastor. Good luck. Proverbs 24, 16. For the righteous, for though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. What is that talking about? Seven times? That means after the eighth, you are no longer righteous. No, that's not what it's saying. Whenever it talks about the, the, the number seven, it's talking about this picture of perfection or completion. And when it talks about falling seven times, the idea is that you have completely fallen, that you've completely messed up, that you've, you've completely, utterly, perfectly messed up. It ain't like a little mistake. This is a big deal. And though you have completely fallen apart and your life is in shambles right now, what would the righteous person do? You get back up. Scripture's not expecting you to be perfect. Jesus, God's not, he, he, he knows who you are, okay? He bought you broken. He knows he's still fixing you. I mean, maybe you're that super Christian and you gave your life to Jesus and you've never sinned again. And you like, you don't even touch the ground when you walk. You never have heartburn. Everything's perfect for you. you, you the common cold runs from you. You never get sick. You, you're just sinless, perfect being, and you have no issues. But for the rest of us in the room, we all struggle. We're all stumbling at something. There's some, and I, I, I'm not saying, hey, that's your excuse to go sin. Hey, God knows you're going to mess up. You might as well mess up. No, that's not what it's saying. Don't read that part. But don't get beat down because what did the Bible tell us? Eight, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, why would there be condemnation? Because you stumbled. You stumbled. 
But when you're in Jesus, repentance picks you back up. And you call out to Jesus and he forgives you and he wipes the slate clean again and you're all good with him and you're back. In, I'm, and whenever I see it, hear me clearly. When it says you stumble, it doesn't mean you've fallen away, that, you, that you're no longer saved. It just means there's a strain in the relationship now. I mean, if you, if for those who are married, you understand strain in relationship. I mean, you have a strain in your relationship doesn't mean divorce. Forget it. She argued with me. We're done. That's not what it's saying. That's not what, that, that's not what this is. You're still married. There's a strain in the relationship, though. Communication has been hindered. There, there's things blocking access to one another. The intimacy level goes down whenever there's sin. But it's so easy to come right back. I'm telling you guys, it's easier than trying to make things right with your wife, okay? which is hard, so hard. But with God, all we gotta do is ask. And he brings us right back into that right relationship. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. I'm just guessing there's not too many perfect people in the room. I mean, he could have picked anything, right? He could have, thought your, could have mentioned your thought life or the way you're thinking about things or, or the lust that's in your heart. But no, he, he, says, he, says, he says, if you're perfect in what you say, if you can keep a tight rein on your, on your tongue, if, if, if you can keep your, be, no fault in what you're saying, that you keep everything in check, that you're perfect. What is that telling you? It's almost like this false hope has been set up right here, and we're going to get to it a little bit further as we get down a little bit further in chapter. Like this is, this is like, this isn't going to happen. We're all going to stumble in what we say. Everything, that, the words that are, that there's times when you say things and you're like, man, I wish I hadn't have said that. Have you ever been there? Well, if you were perfect, you wouldn't have. That's all I'm going to, just leave it there, right? Verse 3. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Why? Because it hurts them. Because if you don't do what you want them to do, that bit digs in. Verse 4, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by, the strong, by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Man, it kind of makes tongues of fire sound different now, doesn't it? Your tongue can destroy you. This is where James 1.26, remember we skipped over that in the first chapter because I wanted to, we wanted to bring it in. James 1.26, those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceives themselves and their religion is worthless. Why? Because you can set the whole course of your life on fire with the words that are coming out of your mouth. All kinds of animals, verse 7. Birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. No human being can tame the tongue. Well, didn't he say I'd be perfect if I kept control of my tongue, that everything would be great? Yeah, that, he, was, he didn't, that was rhetorical. You couldn't get there? Because human beings can't tame the tongue? I remember one time when I was, I was younger and stupid and foolish, and I, and I, I, I swore a lot. I, cuss, I 
cursed a lot. And, and, and a, a friend of mine cursed a lot. And I told him, man, you, you curse too much. And he goes, I curse too much. You curse too much. And so we, we started this little thing. We, we, we had a, a jar, and we started putting money in the jar. If you said a, a bad word, you put money in the jar. And the idea was eventually you're going to go broke because you won't control your mouth. But I was broke anyway, so... But no matter how much it cost me, I could never stop. I couldn't control it. It, 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 was, it was bigger than I could do. I, I, I couldn't do it. It, 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 was, it, was, it was beyond control for me. And I would always say, man, I, I got to stop this. I got I to gotta change these things that I'm saying. I, and I remember hearing people say, oh, you sound ignorant when you curse. You know, those are ignorant words that you're speaking. I'm, yeah, I'm ignorant. I'm, I'm not very smart, evidently, because I'm using the wrong adjective. But as much as I wanted to, I could not control it. I couldn't stop it. It says it was full of deadly poison, that it was evil. Because it wasn't just the words that I was saying as adjectives. It was the things that I was saying to people or about people or the hurtful words that I was speaking to somebody. Have you ever heard the little the saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Liar. Not true. Words can kill. Words can hurt. They're destructive when they're not controlled. And the thing is, if you're not controlling it, then who is? Look at this, uh, Proverbs 18 and 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. It has the power of life and death that's in your tongue. That is a couple ways that that makes sense, right? That, that we can understand that, you know, because of the, the, when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, then we will be saved. So the power of life is definitely in the tongue. But the power of death, you can speak words over people that will hurt them so deeply. That will affect them for years and years to come, if not their entire life. Yeah, there is definitely power in your words. There is definitely life and death in the words that you speak. Proverbs 26, 18 through 19. I like this one. Proverbs 26, 18 says, Like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death. Isn't that a picture, right? <laughs> is one who deceives their neighbor and says, I was only joking. How many times have you heard that one? Somebody says something harsh to you, and they're like, I was just kidding. Mm. Where are you? Maniac shooting flaming arrows of death. Once it's gone out, it's too late. I remember playing this game one time, this object lesson, if you will, in youth group one time, and we had tubes of toothpaste, and we were racing to see who could empty the tube of toothpaste the fastest. And we spit it all out of there. You just emptied that tube right out. And then, they, 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 yeah, we win. And like, okay, now the first one to put it all back. And they're like, trying. They're like, I can't get it back in. Like, that's the way it is with your words. Oh, it falls out so easy, but you can't get them back. Jesus said that you're going to give a, 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 an account for every idle word that comes out of your mouth. Oh, the life and death that it affected, it, it could be someone else and it could be you. Because that power is there. But it also works in the other way, too. Proverbs 12 and 25, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. So in the same way that you can tear someone down, you can build them up. You can bring affirmation. Words of affirmation are great for people. You're like, well, why do they need it? Because we do. Because we need our heart to be encouraged. Because, man, we're being beat down by everything all day long, and sometimes it's good to hear somebody say, hey, you did good at that. Amen. I mean, 30 other people could have done better, but you did good. I mean, you were just right above C average, but it was okay. You're a B. You're a B. I'm joking, but... Affirmation 
is great when you affirm someone, when you tell them that they're doing good. It, it, it cheers them up. It makes them want to continue. It, makes them, it, it, it encourages their heart. Now, verse 9, James 3. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear frig, figs? Not frigs, figs. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Because once the salt's interjected, it's just salt water. Brine water is not fresh water. And the instant that it becomes brine, there's no more fresh to it. And the same thing when it's coming out of your life, whenever it, that, 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 that venom's coming out, then the life is gone. So how do we fix that mouth? How do we correct this thing? If it can't be controlled by us, what do we do? What's the answer? The problem is your heart. Like I, the more I tried to stop using the words I should not use, I couldn't do it. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, he did it. So many people got all these little things, these ticks, the, the little sinful things that they're like, I wish I could quit doing this. Uh, pray for me that I'll quit doing this. I, I need to quit doing this. Well, how do you quit doing this? It ain't by quitting it. It's by doing the right thing first. It's by getting your heart right, getting it because we're trying to treat symptoms instead of the problems. And the problem is the condition of the heart. Matthew 8, 15, 18. But the things that come out of the person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them. What's in your heart is coming out of your mouth. Luke 6, 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So is there a lot of hate coming out of your mouth? A lot of death coming out of your mouth? And you need to look into the heart. Are you just angry all the time, just spewing your venom all over everybody? Everybody's just so dumb. I can't believe this. No way. If I, we just had smarter people, Lord. We're just letting our mouth go off. And it ain't about everybody else. It's about what's in you. What's the condition of your heart? Because that's what the mouth is flowing out of, is what's in the heart. So how do we fix it? Matthew 12, 33. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil, say anything good. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So how do you fix it? You make the tree good. We know what it is to be the bad tree, right? We've, we've been there. We've all been there. That's who we were when we were lost and in sin, but some of us, we gave our life to Jesus, and yet we're still seeing this bad fruit coming out. Like, like, why am I still seeing this? I gave my life to Jesus. So what's the problem? The communication between you and Jesus. It's affecting your heart. And you've got to get back into alignment with him. You've got to repent of those things that caused you to stumble and get back up, righteous one. Get back up. Give yourself back to him and let him make the tree good again. Let him make the fountain pure where living water can flow from you again instead of brine. 
instead of salty water, instead of the water that, 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 that's good for nothing but death. We've got to let him fix our heart. That's the only way to fix all of the symptoms. He, he's pulling out the mouth here, but, but there's so many other things that it can look like, that it can represent itself as, that it can, that it can show itself to be. But the mouth is just the most prevalent one because it's the one that gets us in the most trouble. Oh, maybe you ain't, you, you're not swearing, but maybe it's just gossip. Maybe it's the coarse jesting, the, the harsh things that you're saying that, that you shouldn't be saying. Maybe it's, it's partaking in those conversations you know you shouldn't. Because something in your heart needs to be fixed. And the only way to do that is get a heart transplant. Not really. It's to repent. To acknowledge sin to be sin. Stop making excuses, because that's what we do, don't we? But it's her fault. <laughs> she makes me so mad, and then those words just come out. I can't help it. She gets me so angry, and I say those wordy dirts that I don't want to say. And I say things about her that I just, I want to crush her, but I can't touch her, so I use words to do it. I mean, you've, been, you've, you've either given them or you've received them, probably both. We've all been there. And the problem has nothing to do with that person. Ooh, don't you hate that part? And it has everything to do with what's in you. Because there's a, no point at which that you should be able to let the, let the Holy Spirit have to leave the room because of what you're about to say. And if you got to start something like, pardon my French. And if that ain't French. <laughs> forgive me for what I'm about to say. And it, I've heard people tell me that. You, forgive me for what I'm about to say. Don't say it. Just don't even go there. Like, what are you about to say that you got to say, forgive me ahead of time? <laughs> like, you're a crazy person. You know that. I'm about to say, I'm going to say it. Don't. How about just pray for a little bit? Seek the Lord. I, mean, I remember one time there was this guy doing something stupid, and I was like, I'm going to go tell him in the name of the Lord what he needs to do. He is messing up so bad, and he's driving me nuts. I'm going to go over there, and, I, and I'm, I'm like, I'm getting ready to go out the door, and my wife says, you better pray first. I'm like, shut up, devil. I want to pray. I want to give him a piece of my mind. My dad always told me the problem with giving somebody a piece of your mind is eventually you're going to run out. Because you keep giving that thing away, there ain't much left. And I was like, oh, I was so mad that she even told me to pray about it. And I got in the truck, and I, you know, I closed that door, and God was like, oh, so you're not going to? I'm like, mm, okay. And I prayed all the way to his house. And when I pulled up at his house, I got out. I was like, hey, what's going on? And we just had a little chit-chat. And he's like, what brings you over here today? Oh, nothing. Just, just thinking about you. Different ways I wanted to kill you in your sleep or run over you with my car. And... But God completely changed it before I ever could get there. Because it wasn't about that guy as much as it was about my heart. And I was pastoring. And I was going to give him Jesus with both barrels. But my heart wasn't right. So it's all about fixing the heart. And if you're going through something right now and oh, you're just on edge all the time and everything's got you mad and you know you've been, not, and maybe, maybe you ain't even said it all yet, but you're sure thinking it a lot. And you know if I keep thinking about it, it's going to come out. I'm about to do it. Why don't we just give it to Jesus and let him fix that heart? And you ain't got to go around looking all crazy. You ain't got to apologize to everybody for everything you just said. Because that's the worst, right? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I mean, you might as well run over with the Mack truck. I'd rather that. 
then have to apologize for it. But that's just, that's who we are. And we need that heart change. And we need God to fix us. So maybe if you're in the middle of something tonight, maybe you've been battling some different things in your life and, and that, that frustration, you can feel it, 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 it hits the boiling point so quickly. Well, how about we just give it to Jesus tonight? Maybe you're just on edge at work and, and they're driving you crazy, they're driving you nuts. And you're just like, man, God, give me a new job. Well, how about we just get a new heart? And then let him lead us to where he wants us to go. Like, if they do that again, I quit. Don't quit. Maybe in your marriage, things are tough. And you need God to speak life. But all you feel is that vitriol, that, that anger because of what they're doing and the things that they've said to you. Well, you know where it starts? It starts with your heart change. Yeah, I'm going to change my heart and they're going to still be that same person they were and it's going to make me so angry again. Change your heart and let God change theirs. And that's a great thing that, about the Holy Spirit being the Holy Spirit is I don't have to do his job and he's really good at it. And if we just let him do his thing, he can fix it. Amen? So tonight, we're going to pray just a little bit as we're getting ready to leave here tonight. And, and we're just going to ask God to fix our heart so that the rest of us lines up. Because all the things that are out of order, the disorder, the disease that's in us, that sin that's infecting us, is causing us to do things and to think things and to say things that shouldn't be there. And it's setting your whole life on fire because you're not fixing the heart. So tonight, let's just pray. And let's give him our heart tonight. Let's ask him to fix that area of our life where we've stumbled, where we've fallen, where we've made that mistake. Let's just call it sin. And let's repent. And let's get back in alignment with his word where we can hear his words where we can hear his leading for our life, where we can know that he's there and we can open that line of communication back up and we can know that he, he's listening to us as we listen to him. Amen? So let's pray together. God, we just come to you tonight so thankful for your word, so thankful that you give us the book of James to show us that in the midst of all of this turmoil, in the midst of the, the fire that our life has been set on fire by, that, that it isn't about everybody else, but it's, it's about us. That God, it's about my heart. It's about the condition of my, my soul that, that I, I've, I've abandoned this relationship with you and I, I've, I've stepped away from your leading. I've stumbled. And my communication with you has been hindered. The leading that only you should have in my life. God, I've taken that place. And God, tonight, God, I just pray that as we sit here, as we, as we pray to you that that you would help us to fix our hearts tonight by surrendering them to you, by giving it all back to you again. God, help us to recognize sin as sin. God, in the areas where we've messed up, where we've burned it all down, God, we repent. Heal our hearts tonight, Lord. Bring us back into right relationship with you. Help us to be like the righteous that though we may fall and make a complete mess out of things, that we will get back up. Not under our strength, but under yours. Pick us up tonight, Lord. Forgive us of our sin. Make our hearts right with you again. 
God, make us conscious of what we say, that we would speak life and not death. God, let us be a life spring of, of hope for those who are around us who are no longer spewing venom. God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I got kind of a funny story. I'm going to close with this. I remember one time we were playing basketball, and I, I was really convicted by God about how harsh I was with my friends I was playing basketball with. And, and it was always me and John going against each other for whatever reason because the big guys were on the other team. And me and John were playing one night, one day, and, and we're playing basketball, and, and, and we're doing stuff, and I would always like, oh, you're terrible. That's the worst shot ever. And all, you know, we'd always just, we'd just pick on each other like crazy. And I remember he, he was shooting, and he was off like, just keep shooting, John. You're going to get on. You're doing, that was a great shot, John. Man, great defense, John. And I'm just doing all that. Just, and he's like, what's wrong with you? He's like, stop. You're getting weird. I was like, well, I just feel bad for all the negative things I was saying every time. We, he goes, we're supposed to trash talk when we're playing basketball. Quit. It's not a sin. <laughs> I guess you felt like it was wrong at the time. So I, I just told him, okay, you're terrible. Let's play. <laughs> but I, you don't realize the weight of your words a lot of times. Even in, in, in your jesting and your joking, it, it, it carries a lot of weight with people. And I, I, it's great. You know, kids, they grow up, man, they want to be the class clown. They want all the attention. But the one that was the smartest kid in the room was the one making all the money. The one that, had, that knew all the facts, that had all the information, and the clown, well, I don't know what that guy's doing anymore. He may be in court tomorrow, I'm just going to say. So get informed into the Word of God. Let the word of God transform your heart and live that liar that's that, that liar, that that life that's on fire for Jesus. And quit your lying, man. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's let's pray we're gonna be dismissed. God, we just thank you for your word tonight. God, I just pray that we're able to keep a tight rein on our tongue because of the change that you bring to our hearts. And God, bring that change tonight. Continue to convict us of the sin that we've stumbled into and keep pulling that thing out of our life so that we can have the right heart so we can give the words of life to those who are around us. God, I just pray that as we go to work tomorrow, as we go to school, as we go through our life tomorrow, I just pray that the words of life would flow from us, that we would be a, a spring of hope and a spring of life to those who are around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a good night, and we will see you on Sunday. I searched the world.